Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 56 of Ask the CEO with Avraham Gatheil. Today, I'd like to introduce a very special guest. He is a neuroscientist and a neurotechnology entrepreneur. He holds degrees in neuroscience from Harvard, MIT, Williams College, and completed postdoctoral fellowships at UCSD Medical School and the Salk Institute in San Diego and a visiting year at Oxford. His academic work has been published in journals such as Science and Nature Neuroscience, and he has been invited and presented his research and his innovations in dozens of cities in over two dozen countries. His PhD dissertation, investigating the neural intricacies of the human language system via intracranial electrodes placed inside the brain as part of epilepsy surgery, won the prize for the best dissertation across all departments at Harvard last year. At MIT, he won several teaching prizes. He also worked at Bell Labs and in startups and mid-sized companies in Boston, San Diego, London, and Dublin, and has been the principal investigator for seven government contracts for wearable brain monitoring systems to access and improve cognitive and mental states. He founded BrainPower LLC to bring neuroscience ideas and technological innovations to people with special challenges who can directly benefit from them the most. It is my honor and pleasure to welcome the one and only Dr. Ned Sahin. Welcome. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me on. It's a great pleasure having you. Whereabouts are you, Ned? I'm in the Boston area. I'm in Cambridge, right in Kendall Square, across from MIT. Uh, a, re a really great place to find very powerful brains. <laughs> <laughs> for sure, for sure. So talking about brains, it is really fascinating, the work that you're doing. Um, I especially love the pictures on the wall behind you with the kids wearing those cool Google glasses. Uh, tell us a little bit about what brain power is all about and what is it that you do? We try to make the world a little bit easier to live for people with challenges based on how their brains learn. And so, yeah, there's the whole Google Glass aspect, which puts a computer enhanced world right there in front of my eye or in front of the eye of a, of a child, like, yeah, the children behind me. And we base this on some of the principles of neuroscience and psychology, and also principles of video games, which we know get people engaged a lot more than textbooks. But we try to hide inside that video game-like experience a, a learning experience that is suited to what those people need at that time. And sometimes what that means is learning, uh, well, how to signal that you're paying attention to someone else, how to guess whether he or she is happy, angry, sad, um, and to control the certain behaviors that sometimes come up when one is anxious. A lot of those things are, are typical features of autism. Yeah, and you know what's interesting is, and I love about what you're saying, is that how you've leveraged or harnessed gaming, which is something that children just turn to naturally. It's naturally, just yeah. right part of being a child, and you've used that in, to make it into a fun experience to function within uh, societal parameters. Some people say, oh, well, geez, my child doesn't even wear sunglasses or people with autism won't put something on their head. Why would they put that funny thing on their head? Well, sunglasses don't give them much. I mm -hmm. give them mom turning into their favorite cartoon character. I give them dad being like a space alien and they can have a fun game about it. So it's, it's a lot more fun. And then on top of that, uh, you know, the kids and the young adults, they're quite aware that there are social rules that are these unwritten rules and they don't get it necessarily, or it's they're getting it a little bit after others and that's maddening. So if they feel like this is a chance to refine skills that might get them uh, to do better in class and do better after class, maybe get a date, uh, it might be, you know, really useful. And by the way, it feels kind of fun to do. So there's a lot more motivation. And then it is worth putting something on your head, even if it feels a little scratchy, which actually it's pretty light and simple. And I'm sure they don't care because like you said, they're playing a video game. Yeah. 
Really cool. So how does, how does it exactly work? So, uh, you know, tell us a little bit about some of the kids you've worked with. Well, there's two different questions there. First of all, the kids we get to work with are wonderful, amazing and, and bright and sometimes uh, somewhat locked away from the rest of the world or let's say their, um, their potential is, is not fully realized. Uh, so it's, it's a, a wonderful thing to feel like I'm bringing new smiles to these children and new possibilities. But to get to the specifics of like, how does it actually work? Okay, if I wear this, I have a computer screen right here, but I can also still see you. So when I'm looking at a person, I see the person in real life, and then I also see a extra information about that person. Now, if I'm, maybe I'm not even looking towards the person, but the person's face will be circled and there might be a funny puppy dog or something going on there. And that, ooh, that catches my attention. And when I do now, face is circled, the circle is completing, I'm getting points, I'm getting audio rewards, I'm getting gold stars, because I'm maintaining this face-directed gaze, this eye contact. And if that's stressful to me, well, this thing measures the stress. It wasn't meant to, but our patent pending software allows it to do so. And so if it's a stressful experience, the game changes a little bit, lets me off the hook for a while. Um, all of that is possible only because we have fairly advanced artificial intelligence and data processing on board in this little microcomputer here, but uh, actually almost like a supercomputer of previous years, but it's wearable on the head. So that's one thing. Another thing is uh, another game. When I look at a person, it will float to emojis, to little emoticons on either side of the person's face, maybe a happy face and a surprised face. Uh, depending on what the person was displaying there. And I have to guess which was the correct one. So, so simple, but not only am I getting an assist, turning a complex face into a little cartoon, little emoticon, um, I have to choose the right one. So now I'm engaged with that as a game or I'm not, and we can measure that. I get it right or wrong, we can measure that. And we can give feedback that's encouraging and we can engage the other person so that the other person's actually having a dialogue. And now I'm learning about these emotional expressions and I'm having a conversation or if I'm not a speaking person, at least I'm having a, an interaction. Uh, we find that kids love it. Parents love to have this excuse and this um, formulaic way of interacting that then blossoms into a more natural way of interacting. It's, it's, really, it's really good all around. You know, this is the first time that I've heard that people are leveraging artificial intelligence for learning, for helping people with uh, something like autism. You know, you think of AI as something that you can help for business, you can help uh, with customer service, sort of offload, you know, all those annoying phone calls. But here, you, what you're doing is you're leveraging artificial intelligence to actually help people learn how to function in the real world. You know, I like to say that we're using artificial intelligence to unlock natural intelligence. Yes, yes that's such a beautiful way to put it. Now, are you finding with any of these children that they're retaining that knowledge from the game so that they could use it intrinsically? Yes, yes. I mean, this is the big question and the big point of what we do. We're not trying to teach someone to beat the game. We're trying to teach someone to be himself and be out in the world. And the game itself actually uh, is designed to be engaging enough, but not so engrossing that the person is lost in the game. On top of that, the rewards of the game relate to the rewards of the actual behaviors. So let me make that concrete. Let's say I'm uh, having this game that relates to, um, yeah, recognizing the emotions of others. If you get it right, I could offer you a cookie. Or if you get it right, I could have some alien get killed over here and you get some points, like a typical game. Uh, but that's not the point. The point of it is that interacting with the other person. And so our rewards actually have to do with the interaction with the person. And so I'm rewarded by, first of all, gaining further knowledge that I, I know what the other person was uh, expressing. 
and the other person is now prompted on the, the app that lives on his or her phone to say something to me of, of social reward and to interact with me about that emotion. Like, oh yeah, that's right. That was a surprise face. Um, what makes you surprised? You know, if this person is, is at the level where he or she can interact in that way. You know, this is a, it's actually a social reward. That's a big difference. It's subtle. I might have to reflect on that. But the reason it matters is that we're not training them like you might train a, you know, an animal. You just want the behavior. You don't tell them why you want it. You just kind of get them and cajole them there. This is like respecting the person and saying, this may be your intention to interact with others. We're giving a little bit of an assist. But when you're done, you can discard the game and get on with your life. Yeah. And, you know, everybody has their own talents and skills and they may be slow in some areas, but it doesn't mean that they can't grasp it. It just means that they learn in a different way. Yeah. At a different speed, in a different way, and may seem very different, but maybe fairly similar for that person, just get expressed differently. We can't know all of that. We try to give experiences that will help the person find his or her own way to, to a goal without judgment and without pity. This is just a tool one uses. Wow. And, you know, just to think about how far we've progressed as, as a race where, you know, we used to medicate these kids and now we're actually finding solutions to the problem. Yeah. Yeah. And getting right at the core of it. Yeah. You might need a medicine for some kinds of anxiety and whatnot, but you're not going to find a pill you can give to a child and he's going to swivel around, look at mom and say, I love you. <laughs> That's not what a medicine is going to give, but boy, that would be good for that mom and for that child. So that's, that's not where we're going to get with medicine. That is where we're going to get with uh, educational tools that focus on the behavior and then the underlying concepts that beget that behavior. Yeah. So let's take a minute, just talk about the experience. So again, I'm just you know, looking at these pictures behind you. And for those of us that are listening on the audio, right, just to describe it. So there are these pictures of children with look of surprise on their face by putting on the Google Glass. What's the experience like for them when they put it on for the first time? It, it is amazing. And I think it's a feeling of, wow, I see something and no one else does. So now I'm the one who gets the joke first. I'm the one who's on the inside and the cool side of things. So there's that feeling of in inclusion and hyper inclusion. There's also just a new concept and kids love new concepts and they digest them fast. So suddenly their brains get it. And even mom who might've been saying, I don't know if, he, if he's going to understand that thing. Well, she's going to be getting lessons from him in a few minutes. <laughs> I can only imagine. <laughs> So that's part of it. You know, and one of the things is we've been working on this very carefully for years. It's finally on sale. I mean, this has been the first time that the general public can get access. And I'm super proud of that because we're scientists. We wanted to do this very carefully and methodically. And now is the time we're ready to get out there. Wow, that is really exciting to hear. Now, is this something that people can just purchase on their own? Or is this something that goes through an insurance company? How does that work? Yeah, no, they can purchase it on their own. Insurance companies are the best and worst thing that happened to America, and we are happy to not be part of that system. <laughs> we would like to make it accessible to every family, and we have many other plans to do that. The, for now, though, it's, it's like uh, getting a couple of iPads or something like that. It's, it's technology and software. And you can go to our website, uh, BrainPower, and that's mm -hmm. brain-power.com. And that's, that's where to go for now. Right now, that links to our uh, site where you can pre-order, and then it'll go back to being much more information. But that's where to go, brain-power.com, and, and keep up with how we, how we communicate this. Uh, it, it's really exciting. We have scientific papers out as well. 
that is, and I'll check that out and, and I'll put the link in the show notes so people uh, watching or listening can just go and click on that and go right to that. Great. And this is definitely a major public service uh, you know, to, to our community and to the world at large. So, Ned, how did you get started in all this? Well, first I was born and then I got curious about everything and then, oh wait, so <laughs> it's hard to know where, where to begin. The obvious place is where I founded the company, but there's a little bit of a precedent to that, like all those schools and degrees you mentioned before. I'm a neuroscientist, PhD and postdoc in the field, and I wanted to do something that was both brain science and helpful for people in their daily lives. A lot of my previous work, while exciting and published in journals like Science, is not accessible for the average person and doesn't have a direct corollary in, in your daily life. Uh, eventually it will, but I want to do something that was more direct. And I got into autism uh, in a certain way, but I won't bore with a long story here. And I have always been a nerd about technology and there was this new stuff coming out from Google. And I put it together and everyone said, good idea, keep going. And they're supposed to tell you you're crazy. So I thought, uh, <laughs> maybe I'm doing something wrong because they're yeah. not telling me I'm crazy. <laughs> but I kept going. But importantly, it's been a very interesting set of transitions of, of just myself and myself and a student and then a ragtag student army from MIT and growing and growing to several offices and some really, really dedicated staff. Uh, many of our staff have autism. And so we're, we're really pushing this through and, and growing and, and pivoting often as to how much to rely on the hardware and the software and all kinds of things that maybe if this were more of a show focused on entrepreneurship, I could go into. Um, but I can say that at the core of it is passion and the core of it is the mission to enable and empower people to live their, their best selves and to be as self-reliant as possible. Beautiful. And what was your decision to start that business? Yeah. You know, I guess there's two ways to think about that. One, why a business versus me just going on to being an academic or being just completely a business. Whereas right now I think of myself and our team as a business and some aspects of a nonprofit, some aspects of a non-governmental organization. And uh, yeah, so why start at all a business? Because the business, business at its core is people exchanging value for currency with other people. In a very abstract sense, I have to build something that's valuable to you, and you have to say, I'm gonna give some form of currency, whether it's my usership or money or something else, in exchange for that. And that transaction requires real-time value. And, and some aspects of what I was doing before in research uh, are so necessary, but they only require future value. And that's very important. We can't not invest in our future. But I'm sorry if this is a bit of an abstract discussion. I really wanted to feel like I was helping people directly. And that was possible through this tech-infused business. And then why to model it in this way. I guess the scientist in me still wants to be doing research studies, so we do. And the humanist in me wants to see the actual people that we're helping. And so the kids come into the office, yeah, like in the pictures behind us. And, you know, and, and why the team, our team is all passion and, and of course, lots of brain. Beautiful. And that's really the way to go. You know, like uh, Gary Vaynerchuk is uh, fond of saying, live your passion. And mm -hmm. that's what you've done. Yeah. Fantastic. And uh, yeah, by the way, we have many entrepreneurs that tune into this show. So this is definitely 100% entrepreneur focused. Awesome. So, you know, you, you mentioned that now, you know, you put in a lot of research and uh, you finally made it to the point where this product is now on the market. What were some of the ups and downs you experienced along the way? Yeah. Ups are always those smiles and those moms telling me this is going to change their lives. And that's, that's amazing. And, and we've had a lot of accomplishments. We've also had times of, of fear. And I bear 
pretty much the fear <laughs> as the founder <laughs> of course of you know how are we going to get this out to people uh, will they understand the hardware what kind of distribution models and price points can can really help uh, yeah should we go through insurance which seemingly takes the price down because insurance covers it for the families but of course the process of getting there means your actual price has to go up fivefold or more and the ones who don't get it through insurance are even worse off and and cost just increases in every aspect of the organization it's it's not good so there are many choices and there are many times that people are out there very willing to tell me their opinion and and that's great because i need external opinions but um, sometimes you have to know when to not take them and just carry on with mission and purpose and focus so so yeah there, there's that uh, and some yeah and on the upsides i guess we've been covered by two three hundred press uh, articles and or tv appearances we've gotten a lot of awards and we've again gotten those awards and rewards from the families saying that this really matters to them and that's such a beautiful thing. So, Ned, what keeps you motivated every day? Everything I just said. You know, this is this is passion and focus and team. This is hard work. I know that I'm doing something that's hard and engages my whole brain. And because it's artificial intelligence, it's neuroscience, it's psychology, it's uh, interacting with children and and the, the fickle whims of children and autism itself, which is a very complicated set of conditions, and all the stakeholders involved in that, from parents to children to schools to districts to therapists to neurologists and neuropsychologists and so forth. And boy, it's a totally new form factor of a device and operating systems changing all the time and, 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 let alone all the managerial and the usual company aspects so it's complicated i like complicated i take on complicated and that keeps me going and and the rewards of of the micro successes and and the, the larger milestones definitely keep me going well it sounds like you're in the right business for that <laughs> so you know we uh we talked about the business and you know what you're rolling out right now where are you looking to take this business say in five years from now mm -hmm. yeah so we already have an autism project and that's our flagship we have another way of applying this kind of technology and that's for people who've had brain injuries and so as I mentioned, this is a computer and it has sensors. It has an accelerometer and gyroscope. So we can measure small head motions. And like in the autism, we can measure rocking and other signs that the person is undergoing potentially stress or a self-calming episode. Um, but also someone who's had an injury might be off balance and we can pick that up someone may get dizzy upon performing certain complex neurological tasks, uh, like moving your arm and following it with your eyes. Turns out that's a complex neurological task. And we can measure that. And we can measure blink rate and the sounds of certain aspects of, of the body functioning. And we can compute whether there's a prob probability of injury. We're working on in that direction. And we can also make the video game that helps you recover from those, those injuries. So that's why at first it might seem, wait, TBI, traumatic brain injury, and autism, how are they related? But hopefully that little segue helped you understand how they're related at the technological level. And so we're pushing that one forward. And there are other adjacencies. There are other parts of this um, constellation of brain-related and invisible conditions that I want to address. And I, I put it that way because, yeah, so traumatic brain injury, you go off to war, you go off to football, you go off the ladder, and you hit your head. Now, after the, the bruise goes away, let's say, there's no sign that something went wrong. You didn't even have the dignity of losing an arm or having a massive scar somewhere. But inside, things are, are damaged, and it takes a long time to recover. So, and with autism, again, it's invisible. Um, 
so I have a lot of empathy for people who have to deal with something that makes every day like climbing a mountain when everyone else is just sailing by and I want to help. So I want to go into other adjacencies like that where people are dealing with uh, major depressive disorders, for instance, and there's another silent and invisible condition of the brain that greatly affects quality of life. And yeah, so it, within a few years, we want to be addressing some of these with very clear and tangible and daily life type solutions. And I'm definitely looking forward to seeing that. So Ned, if you could rewind the clock, let's say 12 months, would there be anything differently that you do? Yes. <laughs> but now the list is going to take a while. <laughs> I'm always learning, right? If you got to the end of organic chemistry and didn't say you would do something differently on the first quiz or in the first part, and like apparently you didn't learn. So I'm in continuous crash course learning of entrepreneurship. I didn't begin as one, right? I'm a scientist. I, I got a PhD, the, not an MBA. So all of this is learning. And there are many things that I would do differently. And yet I feel like we've had great success and, and this is a great place to be. So Ned, you know, this is a very fascinating topic and we actually have a few questions from our audience. Oh, okay, great. So I'd like to read you a couple of questions. We have a question from Irma Rastagaiva. Uh, she is an innovation catalyst and co-founder of Evira Health in the Boston area. And Irma says, hi. Hi. At, at XMed last week and elsewhere this year, much attention is being paid to the microbiome and, and its role in an array of autoimmune or other diseases. What, if any, connection is there between microbiome and autism? So the question is, what does the microbiome have to do with autism? And for those who are not paying a lot of attention to the microbiome, it's the trillions of cells in our body that are not actually part of our body. These are the, the bacteria and so forth that live in us, and they form a society and it's highly organized, and they actually, I say they're not part of us, but they are part of us because we have a symbiotic relationship. And they dictate a lot of the inputs and outputs at the cellular level, and we're finding out more that they, not just at the cell-to-cell -cell cellular level, but in aggregate, have major impact on, of course, our gastrointestinal health, but by proxy and by maybe second order effect, even our mental health, as, as wild as that may seem. Um, so I'm so glad you explained that because I had no clue. <laughs> yeah. And it gives a whole new meaning to having like a gut instinct or this yeah. is what my gut says. Well, actually it might literally, uh, those cells living in your gut might influence your belief states, your mood, your up and down states at a given time, uh, just at a pure, some kind of effect on your mental state level. And then on top of that, if they are causing turmoil and turbulence, if you are continually battling with a, a very uncomfortable bowel, uh, that, that is a distraction. And if you've ever tried to do your, your best cognitive work when there's an ambulance going by and people are honking and someone's knocking on your door, uh, you know that we're not very good in the context of distraction. Imagine if that's all you ever knew. If that you, every day was a headache and every day was a stomach ache and every day was un, unexpected new stimuli to your body. So first of all, contemplate just that simple mechanical issue of if there are issues in your gut, they can be distracting. But it's actually much more than that because these things have systemic inflammatory effects and inflammatory uh, mechanisms can change the brain, basically, and change very important aspects of our mood. And then on top of that, there are levels of interaction that actually I haven't studied and I don't know, I just know that they exist, that this is where it's a little more even seemingly cosmically surprising that there are these actual effects on the central nervous system and on, on the mind. So. I know that categorically it's possible. I don't know precisely what 
the effects are with relation to autism, because I literally don't know, didn't study, and because it's still a story that's being written. Uh, if I'm to opine, I would say that if there are 10 units of effect happening from the, the microbiome, it might look soon as if there's 20 units of effect happening because there are certain forces that are gonna to want to pin a lot on the microbiome because this is something that you can medicalize. This is something you can make a pill out of. This is something that a pharmaceutical company can get behind and put $100 million into and then get a billion dollars out of. And I'm a little bit skeptical, therefore. I think the science is gonna be real. It's just gonna be overplayed because big companies are not gonna do what I'm doing. They're not gonna do behavioral remedies. They're not gonna do effortful, person in the loop, engaged types of therapies. They're gonna to wanna to send out a pill. They're gonna to wanna to make that one pill in one place identically, send out hundreds of thousands of them and bring in the money. And that will help, but I think they're gonna overemphasize how much it does help. Yeah, it's a lot easier to just give someone a pill and call it a day than to actually do the work. <laughs> exactly. I'm not discrediting it. I'm just saying that there will be a little bit of an overemphasization of it. Overemphasis. Yeah. So our next question from Irma is, in your experience, how is the new reincarnated Google Glass performing? And are you getting the support you need for the platform from Google and or their partners? Thanks. Well, we are one of their partners. So we are one of the few partners of Google. And so therefore, we're allowed to sell Google Glass version 2. I'm not supposed to call it that though it's Google it's a uh, glass enterprise edition and the company that makes it is now X so as you know Google became alphabet and there are companies within it and the one that's focused on the biggest moonshots as they say these uh, amazing projects that can have uh, orders of magnitude more effect than some others and in the past that company is called X and that also is the company that produces Glass Enterprise Edition. We're one of their partners, and so we can sell Enterprise Edition. And we're a unique partner in that we're focused on this kind of application or use case, humanitarian and with end user customers in mind. The question was asked of how does Glass original Explorer edition compare to the enterprise edition. And I have them put in my other office uh, just down the hall, so I can't show it to the camera right now. And we have, uh, yeah, we've gotten support from them and the device has a better processors, some better sensors and a similar form factor, but some key aspects that are a little bit different. One, for instance, seems small, but it matters in this case. Glass, you can't fold it. You can't put it away in any way. So it's an expensive device. And for a child or for someone who wants to just use it occasionally to get feedback, you can't get rid of it. Uh, the new one just folds up. Uh, small, simple aspect. Big difference. You know, it, it is. You can just fold it, put it in your pocket. Um, so that's an external difference. But internally are, is where a lot of the, the brains have changed and matured a little bit. Right. So our next question from Irma, as a company, what is your greatest challenge over the next year? Well, here, let me, let me say this. We're a mission and we're a company. And if you believe in our mission and you want our company to succeed, you can help. And this is a, a great time for me to explain that we've gone live just this week. And for the first time, you can purchase the products we're selling. And if you don't happen to have anyone in your family with autism, you can also accelerate our mission. And on our site, there's the ability to just give a little bit so that we can go a little bit further or faster, or even really dig in and go so far as to sponsor an autistic person to work here. And there are several other large things like that, but let me explain that. Um, we have 
people on the autism spectrum who work at brain power fully employed fully integrated doing great things that are part of our mission and i believe in that and i hire them um, we can hire more into our program which is very enriching and unlike that at, at any other company i know if there were benefactors essentially uh, creating an endowed chair like you do at a university but in this case for someone to work here and have the dignity of be, being employed. And so in the next year, our biggest challenge is growing from where we are to the place where we really need to be to give that professional polish to the software and make sure that the thousands of families out there get it and can use it and can get the support they need and so forth. So we need to level up, but we don't wanna to go to a venture capitalist and have them on our back forcing us to do whatever it takes to get out there and get money for them. We wanna be mission focused. And so we need everyone's help um, spreading the word about the product, which is good on its own and people can purchase it and therefore fuel us or these humanitarian ways of supporting the mission. And you should see, I mean, these, these members of our team are members of our team. They're not singled out in, in that negative way, but they are accommodated in that positive way. And we all learn daily from interacting with and, and being part of their, their lives and their way of integrating into the team. That is, that is such a beautiful thing. Uh, you know, if you think about it, um, you know, you have, there's so many uh, places that accommodate people with disabilities, uh, you know, wheelchair access and things like that. And, you know, here's a way how we can help people that have been dealing with autism integrate into normal life and have jobs like everyone else, which I think is, is such a wonderful service. Great. So we have two more questions from Irma. Okay. So the next question is in the neuroscience of autism, are there recent discoveries that are not yet implemented on your platform? And could you give us a sneak peek? Hmm. So are there new discoveries that we haven't yet had the time or, or bandwidth to implement? And there are new discoveries all the time. And I try to remain current. However, of course, I'm not aware of all of them. So guaranteed, there are many that we haven't integrated because I haven't heard of them yet happy to receive all your feedback. And then there are some things that we're very excited to do and we have specifications laid down that we haven't done yet because we need more coders. And for instance, um, one is in and around advanced stress detection and meltdown prediction using biosignals of of stress and of oncoming behavioral episodes to then deliver the exact right breathing exercise or screensaver or something to do in this little screen that only you see that can help divert you from the moment and then with our patent pending measures measure whether the stress is decreasing on that feedback loop is particularly important that's one that uh, is in the skunk works. And another one I'll just tease about, but uh, it, this is really important. We've been focused on software that helps the person on the autism spectrum uh, see the outside world in a way that's beneficial and that helps integrate. We're also working on something that's the other direction, that let's say the person's brother or employer or parent can put on the glasses and sort of temporarily be autistic. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of exciting concept, right? Now, of course, it's not gonna be perfect. It's not gonna truly transform your brain, but it can change the input in a way that can give you insight just temporarily. And so you could feel what they're feeling like and empathize with them. Yeah, that's the goal. It won't be an identical feeling, it can't be but just a little bit to empathize. And like these exercises, and of course the one that's very simple in some way is to empathize with someone who's blind as to have some aspect of that experience, but it can't just be closing your eyes 
because you know you could undo that at any time and you're getting a lot of other kinds of feedback. But being in, for instance, there's some restaurants that are served only with blind servers and the complete room is absolutely dark and there's no light source allowed and you go through a whole meal and go to the bathroom and other aspects of, of life without having any sight and any capability of sight. It still doesn't really give you the experience, but it's a, at least a closer approximation. And that one's pretty easy in some sense. This one's harder, but we have a few tricks up our sleeve to try to do it. Wow. Wow, that is truly fascinating. And it will be an eye opener for many people to see what it, what it is like that these people live with. Great, our final question, could your technology potentially become device agnostic and available on other platforms or will Google Glass continue to be the only medium? We are not yoked to Google Glass. We are appreciative that Google made Glass and did so years ahead of its time. It's an amazing platform that was well ahead of its time, but it's not the only platform and we are not stuck to it. I actually spent a lot of time and devoted my team's time to rewriting our software so that it is already device agnostic. It can run on any Android device and uh, soon iOS devices. So I mean other headsets and we have six or so other types of headsets in, in the other room things like Google Glass, but a little bit different, as well as running on a phone. But a phone doesn't give you some of the, the benefits that we like out of a heads up system, but it, it gives you a lot more people who already have a phone. So we have experiences that can run across devices already. And as the future brings us more, we will get right on them. Wow. Looking forward to seeing that. Very excited. Thank you. Okay. So tough question. What do you like doing for fun? You think none of this is fun? This is all <laughs> fun. No, well, it's not fun. Man. Look behind me. Everyone's having fun. Oh, you should know. I love, I love those pictures. That, that it looks just amazing. I can give you a tour of others in the office. Want me to move the camera a little bit? Yeah. We have some other people here, and I can't move the camera too much, but over there, um, in the corner you see me with, with the young man there, um, mm -hmm. put it to the center, Danny. Now, he lived in a 24-7 uh, care facility. He's not able to take care of himself, not able to speak, and uh, you know, eating is difficult. He, his handler said there's no way he would be able to even use Google Glass and our software. And they brought him out right away, kind of saw what I was doing. He mirrored my gestures, he put it on, and away he was. He loved it. He was in the experience that it was the prototype of the thing that senses stress and then gives a, a, uh, a nice soothing video. He was enjoying it, played with it for 15 minutes, and they said they've never seen him that calm. Wow. So that was a great moment. Um, above him, one of our wonderful, wonderful children, Ken, and this moment of pure being engrossed in the experience and thinking, wow, this is a new world. Um, there's when I got my article in Wired. <laughs> there's me asleep at the desk, which <laughs> happens a lot because I sometimes stay here well past midnight. And, and these ones you've been seeing in the past, wonderful children, and oh, up, up there, you see I'm by an RV. Well, that's what I did. I went out to buy an RV, took some of my team, and we traveled around the country. We went to West Virginia and Missouri and, and Tennessee and went to autism clinics and saw families struggle with this all day and every day and aren't near you know, Massachusetts General Hospital or great places like that, and they have very little access. And I saw their struggles and felt them, and that greatly informed what we do here at BrainPower. So yeah, that's a little bit of it. That's all fun. Yeah. So Ned, I know you're a busy guy. I'm going to let you go in just a bit. Uh, but just before we do, how do people connect with you? So you can just email me and I hope you'll put that in the notes 
and that's ned at brain-power.com. And of course, you can go to the website, and that's brain-power.com. Perfect. And yeah, we're going to put all that in the show notes so people can get right to you. Thanks. Ned, do you have any parting words of wisdom that you'd like to share with the audience? Well, if it's for an entrepreneur, remember Hofstadter's Law. And Hofstadter's Law by Douglas Hofstadter states that all major projects take much longer than you think, even if you already took into account Hofstadter's Law. <laughs> and sound words of advice. <laughs> And if it's for families touched by autism, uh, I've heard your pain and I, I know without directly knowing some of the struggles and we've tried to build into our software things that can make life just a little bit easier and can allow your, your son or daughter or, or yourself to live a more self-expressed life. And I hope you'll come, come to understand what we're doing and um, have a chance to benefit. Super. Ned, thank you so much for coming down here and sharing your time and your wisdom. I really enjoyed having you. Thank you. Great pleasure.